So just welcome. Um, everybody's bios are going to be um, posted in the chat where um, we have a distinguished group of panelists this morning, and they're all going to be um, presenting on a series of papers um, that were published in a special issue of um, health services research. And um, you can also download and read. We encourage you to download and read these papers. Um, next slide. OK, next slide. So I'm Arlene Bierman. I direct the Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement at ARC. And I'm just going to give you some background on the process, why ARC is so interested in this topic, why we think it's so critical, as well as just a real overview of what our research agenda is and how we developed it. Uh, to, so I think many of you on the call know a lot of this on this slide, but to get everybody on the same level, um, Multiple chronic conditions are common. One in three American adults and four in five Medicare uh, beneficiaries are living with multiple chronic conditions. And in fact, it's the most common um, chronic condition seen in clinical practice. And we all know there's a mismatch between the way we deliver care, which is disease specific, and the needs of people, which is patient-centered. And this has really adverse consequences resulting in care that's often fragmented, of suboptimal quality, and it leads to uh, poor outcomes and increased costs. We also know that uh, the challenge of multiple chronic conditions is a health equity issue. Low-income individuals and racial and eth ethnic minorities develop multiple chronic conditions at an earlier age, and women are more likely to have multiple chronic conditions than men across all age groups. And I think this is the important numbers right here. People with multiple chronic conditions account for 64% of all clinician visits, 70% of all inpatient stays, 83% of all prescriptions, 71% of all healthcare spending, and 93% of Medicare spending. So this is really a hidden crisis that we have a health system that's not designed to provide the care needed by the majority of people who use it. Next slide. So what are we talking about when we're talking about multiple chronic conditions? So um, people use it, often use a definition of those with one or more chronic physical or mental health con diagnosis or both. And the reality is, is it's often calculated with a checklist of diagnoses and mental health and substance use um, disorders are um, you know, eliminated or not included in those lists, as well as, you know, some more uncommon chronic conditions. So even though we know it's very prevalent, our, our estimates are probably an underestimate in terms of the population. And then others use the term multimorbidity in order to include additional factors that contribute to the burden of illness, including disease severity, functional impairments and disabilities, syndromes such as frailty and social factors such as homelessness. And basically to deliver patient-centered care, all these factors need to be taken into consideration. Next slide. So this is um, data from CMS on um, comorbidity among chronic conditions for Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. And I'm just showing this slide to show it's not just um, you know, one or two. First of all, this is a norm you know, over 90% of people with any of these chronic conditions have multiple diseases, and many actually have five or more in addition, um, just highlighting the need to really de design a system to better manage, um, you know, the people that we're caring for. Next slide. Um, the prevalence of uh, multiple chronic conditions is rising. It's really a syndemic. It's a hidden syndemic. Um, but, and the reason is, is because the same risk factors lead to multiple conditions with the aging of the population, rising health inequity, um, and actually COVID. Um, we're good, the prevalence of multiple chronic conditions is going to continue to grow. Um, one study from New York found that 88% of people admitted hospitalized with COVID had multiple chronic conditions. And we know that people with multiple chronic conditions are, are at risk for poor health outcomes with COVID, but also they're developing post-acute sequela of COVID on top of what they have already. So the prevalence of MCC is going to grow. Next slide. 
So ARC's vision for people living with multiple chronic condition is a sustainable healthcare system that delivers high value, coordinated, integrated patient-centered care that's based in primary care and optimizes individual and public uh, population health by preventing and effectively managing multiple chronic conditions. Next slide. So, you know, sometimes when people think about um, multiple chronic conditions, they think about high needs, high cost patients, which are important part of the puzzle, and we do need to do a lot to improve their care. But there's other two other groups that we need to give additional attention to. First of all, multiple chronic conditions, many are preventable. So we need interventions to prevent MCC and target those at risk. And also there's many who have multiple conditions who are stable, active, but they're just one event away from moving into that high risk category. And so what can we do to maintain optimal health and wellness and functioning for as long as we can for people who have multiple conditions? Next slide. Um, at ORC, we developed um, the care and learn model, recognizing that um, delivering healthcare is really about caring as well as about learning. We often focus on the le learning and the evidence generation and, and implementation, but it really comes down to people and meeting their needs. And those are the two functions of the healthcare system in the context of a learning health system. And we thought that this model actually, once we developed it really um, is suitable to improving care and helping us prioritize research around multiple chronic conditions. Next slide. So what's our agenda? Um, I encourage everybody to download the paper, read it. And I'm just gonna give a few themes that came out of, we developed this agenda with in input from stakeholders um, over several years, um, uh, a, a couple of in-person meetings, a big summit. And so this is really uh, the result of the input of the larger community. And, you know, so some of the, the themes that came out is that, you know, interventions at the practice, patient, community, and health system level are all needed along with multi-level interventions, that progress really requires culture change in practice and training, including the integration of behavioral health and primary care. Partnerships and policy are needed to address social determinants of health and address pervasive health inequities related to MCC. Patients, their families, caregivers, clinicians, and communities need to be co-producers of the evidence in order to accelerate progress. We all know that current payment models present a barrier to innovation, and evidence is needed on different payment models and incentives. But the other thing that came out from all our consultations is that we not only need to deliver care differently, we also need to do our research differently and uh, develop study designs and methods that help us get the evidence we need. Um, next question, next slide. So today, um, you know, I just gave you a brief overview of our research agenda. Lucy Savitz and Elizabeth Bayliss are going to talk about a wonderful paper they wrote on emerging models of care for individuals with multiple chronic conditions. Judith Vick and Jennifer Wolf are going to talk about the review they did of person and family engagement in the context of multiple chronic conditions. And Lipika Samal and David Dorr are then going to talk about health information technology to improve care for people living with multiple chronic conditions. And finally, uh, Victor Montori is going to put it all together for us and, and talk about his, his wonderful commentary in the journal. OK, um, next slide. Over to Lucy. Great, thank you, Arlene. And thanks for setting this up so wonderfully. And good morning to everybody who's joined us today. My name is Lucy Savitz. I'm the Vice President for Health Research and I work at the Center for Health Research in Kaiser Permanente's Northwest region. So that is um, Portland, Oregon behind me. Um, and my co-author Elizabeth Bayless will be joining and, and speaking um, in just a moment. Um, I wanna just sort of set this up. So Arlene did a great job of uh, talking about the burden of people living with multiple chronic conditions and the impact on their, their health and their ability to function. Um, but I think one of the things that we've been striving to do over the years, and it's gone by different names, is to try and identify high value models 
of care for people with mono, multiple chronic conditions. And, you know, we um, really set about to identify those models. That was the charge that was given to us. And you can see how we changed the title um, and you'll see why in just a moment. Next slide, please. So we began with the evidence base um, and we went to the evidence, which you know, really is, is the peer reviewed publications that are available to us. And we did a rapid scoping review where we looked over the last five years and identified 14 studies that we could, um, that met our uh, search criteria. And we detailed the search criteria in our paper. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about that. But what we found was that there was really insufficient evidence. And we know there are gaps in the peer reviewed literature and we've known these for a long time. There tends to be a bias in what gets published in the peer reviewed literature such that it's typically, you know, studies that have a positive outcome. Um, when we know we learn as much from our failures in many cases as we do from our successes, there's a limited but growing appetite um, for the, the kinds of research that study these complex interventions as they're being, being put into practice. And um, there's a growing appetite for those publications. I, implementation science has been around a long time. The Journal of General Internal Medicine recently did a special issue and is now devoting space um, and then we also have the Learning Health System Journal and um, Healthcare, among others. And the idea here is that some of these studies are really at the intersection of quality improvement, implementation science, and health services research. And I would also just say that, you know, for a lot of the folks working in as learning health system investigators, and they're embedded in the delivery system, there isn't a lot of incentive for people to publish. So we have these sort of gaps and, and based on that and our inability to sort of solve the puzzle here, just looking at the peer reviewed literature. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, we had the opportunity, and thanks to ARC for commissioning our efforts to work in this area, but to be engaged in two virtual convenings, and you can see them listed here. Arlene referred to them um, in her opening comments, but there was a planning meeting where we got input from a very large group, and then um, subsequently, after we had progressed fairly far ahead in our work, there was a research summit where we, um, as all of the authors did, presented our work and got feedback on where we were. So this was a really integral piece of informing us, are we on the right track? What else could we do? What more could we learn? Next slide, please. And so where we went next was the field. Um, and so we identified um, clinicians who actively treat patients with multiple chronic conditions on a regular basis. These uh, experts were recruited from nine healthcare delivery systems that were located across all US census regions. And you can see here in this um, degree of agreement chart, um, the types of themes, there were eight themes that were identified. Nothing really stands out here. You know, none of this is rocket science, if you will. Um, but what we were seeing was that there was a, a sort of um, shift in people's attention to how they were dealing with some of these issues. And um, next slide, please. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Liz Bayless, who will talk to you a little bit more about what we heard from those key informants as we triangulated the information. Liz? Thanks, Lucy, and hi, everybody. I'm Liz Bayless. I'm an investigator at the Institute for Health Research at Kaiser, Colorado. And this slide is, is really a, a super kind of high level summary of some of the uh, areas that we felt after talking to the system leaders and doing the literature review um, really could benefit from additional evidence. And I think this is um, one sort of piece of the puzzle to, of generating evidence to support the care and learn model that Arlene was just talking about. Um, maybe the, the kind of care that I, I that the system leaders that we spoke with and that the literature review referred to, the kind of care that people are trying to deliver um, is in the center of the schematic. And um, we found that there was this strong need to create a culture of health that integrated community-based solutions as needed, um, fostered patient-centered care, um, including resilience among patients, providers, the systems, and had a very long-term perspective. Um, 
the folks that we talked to also very much wanted to have a population-based approach integrated with tailored and patient-centered care, um, which requires a big picture approach of going back and forth between populations and people, um, taking advantage of what could what kind of care is needed in between visits to the delivery system and to really personalize people's care needs. Um, some of the areas where really specific um, research-based evidence could help those visions um, have to do with aligning financial incentives so that those who are investing in some of these care improvements um, at the system level can also benefit from it. And this is not necessarily um, a model that, that is currently in practice and it, it's to the detriment of, the, of developing these um, effective models. Um, another factor in aligning financial incentives is to make sure that the quality metrics that are used to incentivize some care are, are patient-centered and appropriately timed, um, measuring information that is important to people and to their um, families and to providers is essential for, for aligning care correctly. Um, and furthermore, measuring it at the right time, um, not expecting, for example, short-term returns, rather thinking about the long-term and the well-being of, of the patient and the community. Um, along those lines, we heard multiple, multiple mentions of the importance of identifying and addressing social determinants of health. Um, and that that's a big area and, and ranges from understanding truly what constitutes social risk um, and comparing that with, so with need um, and also understanding how to best address this in a patient-centered way that, that makes sense for individuals and um, maximizes the integration of, of patients, family systems and community resources. Um, there was discussion among the system leaders that we spoke with about the importance of really understanding population heterogeneity. Uh, the MCC population and the multimorbid population is, is by definition very heterogeneous. And while there are some um, situations in which the types of care that people will benefit from are actually common to multiple subpopulations, uh, there are also lots and lots of subpopulations that will benefit from very specifically tailored and personalized care. Um, that, that's goal-directed and, and also reflects the, the fact that care needs are dynamic and, and really not going to stay the same um, from time to time. Um, and then finally, I would uh, add underneath all, underlying much of this uh, evidence generation is, is really optimizing our um, relevant information technology infrastructure. And there's going to be another talk about this in a couple of minutes. Um, but making sure that, that IT infrastructure is used correctly does not substitute for actually talking to people. Um, and at the same time is accessible to patients and families as needed and usable by everybody. Um, one thing that was highlighted as a result of the COVID pandemic is the importance of making um, in-between visit care effective and useful uh, for everybody and that, that there is the potential to do just that. Um, and then also using the IT infrastructure to collect um, metrics and measurable information that's particularly meaningful, getting back up to the, align the alignment of quality measures. So there is obviously plenty to be done here and, and lots to learn, um, but this sort of captures the, the general ideas of, of what the system leaders that we spoke with are thinking about. Liz, ahead, if, I could just, um, if I could just um, emphasize one of the points you made here, um, almost across the board, one of the things we heard that I think is new and different as things emerge is this notion of in-between care. Because when we talked to some of these clinicians, they said, well, maybe these patients touch the healthcare system 16 days a year, but the entire rest of the year, they're at home living in their communities and trying to manage their health. And so the importance of community connections and community supports um, was something new that uh, I think we heard. Thanks, Lucy. And go ahead to the next slide. And so despite our, our charge to, to come up with um, recommended evidence-based models, there, there really isn't a single one, um, but there are a lot of fabulous ideas and a lot of integrated models being developed and implemented. Um, and you can see here the, uh, 
uh, the highlights that, um, to Lucy's point just now, incorporate home and community-based supports. Um, gaps in knowledge really include addressing social risk factors um, over and over and over again. Um, and then supporting a, a multi-dimensional research infrastructure to understand um, what, what these complex interventions should be delivering. And I think we have time for some questions if people want to chat them in. Let's go on to the next presenter and then we'll have some discussion at the end. Thank you. That sounds great, Arlene. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, my name is Jennifer Wolf um, and I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. Um, I want to start by thanking Arlene and AHRQ for developing the care and team model and taking on building the research agenda to bring it about. Um, as in the other papers that are part of the special issue, our paper takes on a fairly broad and complex topic that um, really flows nicely from the comments of, uh, uh, in the last presentation about um, the importance of in-between care. Um, our paper sought to review definitions, concepts, and evidence regarding person and family engagement for persons with multiple chronic conditions and to identify opportunities to advance the field. Um, I'm going to be tag teaming um, with uh, Judith Beck, um, and I'll go ahead and uh, you can advance to the next slide. Um, the background for our paper was a recognition in recent years that there's been a movement in care delivery towards recognizing the essential or starring role of individuals as protagonists of their care and a shift from patients um, being conceptualized as ideally passively complying or adhering with treatments towards a model um, that uh, embraces individuals and families as actively engaged in co-producing health and healthcare. Next slide. Um, in our paper, um, I think you can probably advance further. We, we found a lack of standardization of terminology and definitions, and we sort of review those um, uh, in detail in the paper. Um, we, um, in, in, uh, we adopted the AHRQ definition of engagement, which is listed here on the slide, um, and is defined as a set of behaviors by individuals, family members, and health professionals, and a set of organizational policies and procedures that foster the inclusion of individuals and family members as um, active, part, active contributors to the healthcare team and uh, fosters collaborative partnerships with providers and provider organizations. Um, next slide. Um, so we identified six conceptual models of engagement in our review. Um, uh, these are images, obviously they're too small to see here, but you can read more about them in our paper. Um, each of the models describe factors that promote and support engagement across individuals, organizations, and systems. Um, but we found wide variability in the underlying definitions of engagement that were put forward, the core elements of the models, um, the levels across which engagement transpires, and the emphasis on special populations, circumstances, and outcomes. And none of the models specifically focused um, on individuals with multiple chronic conditions. Um, next slide. Um, we next undertook a scoping review of reviews that addressed engagement in the context of multiple chronic conditions and identified um, six reviews. Um, just one of which explicitly addressed interventions that related to engagement among individuals with multiple chronic conditions. Um, four of the reviews focused on self-management on, among persons with multiple chronic conditions. Um, one review, a systematic review on involvement in decision-making among persons with multiple chronic conditions had as its objective to assess the relationship between interventions and outcomes of interest. Next slide. Um, the components of engagement interventions in our identified reviews generally fell into four buckets, um, including preparation for visits, um, personnel and technology, um, and practice level changes. Um, nearly all of these um, uh, components were focused on the level of direct care and um, did not focus on engagement with, um, with health systems or at the policy level. And um, our review found insufficient evidence to support a causal relationship between interventions related to persons with multiple chronic conditions and outcomes that matter. 
Um, and on the whole, the me mixed methods review identified wide heterogeneity in conceptualizations of engagement, populations of interest, interventions, and outcomes. And this um, heterogeneity limited um, our, uh, the uh, uh, comparisons and synthesis, um, but allowed us to identify five promising areas for future uh, work. And I'm going to turn it over now to Judah. So the first of these uh, promising areas, and you can go to the next slide, <clears throat> uh, is goal-based care, which has been described as a true north in qu high quality care and particularly relevant for persons with multiple chronic conditions. A change in orientation of care from a focus on remediating medical problems in isolation to a whole person approach requires engagement of individuals uh, as partners in their care. And in this category, we ask the following questions. What are best practices for eliciting goals of persons with multiple chronic conditions? And how can we best ensure that goals and outcomes are documented, accessible to, and used by the range of clinicians involved in developing and implementing care plans? Uh, next slide, please. None of the identified uh, reviews in our, in our paper specifically address barriers to engagement among persons with multiple chronic conditions of which there are many um, possibilities, including lack of motivation, low self-efficacy, lack of clarity in informational materials or prescription labeling, receipt of conflicting information and mistrust in the healthcare system. And if we better understood these barriers, we could better uh, tailor interventions to uh, at the individual system and community levels. In this category, we ask what are the greatest barriers to engagement for persons with multiple chronic conditions and how does patient trust affect engagement for persons with MCC? Next slide. Our third um, uh, area um, involves system-based structural change and attention to design. The science of behavioral economics and behavior change has motivated efforts to understand the optimal design of system structures to facilitate desi desired outcomes. How do system level and community level factors support or impede individual engagement? For example, user-friendly technology interfaces and using uniform and clear language. And how do we make engagement easy and intuitive for persons with multiple chronic conditions? Uh, next slide, please. Our fourth uh, promising area um, involves trade-offs. Although some proponents of engagement identify intrinsic value in engagement, there are potentially harmful downstream effects. What safeguards need to be put in place to ensure that a focus on engagement doesn't unintentionally further marginalize vulnerable populations, including those with multiple chronic conditions? And how do we engage vulnerable or hard to, or hard to engage populations in research about engagement? to guide implementation of engagement interventions. And um, next slide, please. Uh, finally, our review showed that family engagement is often subsumed within patient engagement. Although individuals and families are alike in, they're both in that they're both consumers in care, they do have distinct roles. And we know that family caregivers are greatly involved in healthcare system processes. We find this to be a fruitful area for further research for those with multiple chronic conditions. What precisely is their role in engagement in health and healthcare for persons with multiple chronic conditions? What structural systems and policy level elements affect family engagement? And what are essential elements that should be reported in interventions involving friends and family to ensure comparability and implementation fidelity? In conclusion, our review found variability in conceptualizations of engagement and insufficient evidence regarding the effects of engagement among persons with multiple chronic conditions. Across the board, there's mixed and inconclusive evidence that interventions for persons with multiple chronic conditions improve outcomes that matter. We find an engagement, a field of inquiry with great, with great potential, and we anticipate that the further development of tools and technologies to meaningfully engage individuals and their families as co-producers of health we'll move our healthcare system towards more effectively supporting those living and affected by multiple chronic conditions. Um, thank you all. Okay, and finally, Dr. Samal and Dr. Dorf. Thanks, Arlene. 
Um, so I'll be presenting about another of the papers, Health Information Technology to Improve Care for People with Multiple Chronic Conditions. I see a lot of familiar names in the chat, and uh, we welcome questions from the audience through the chat or if we have time verbally. I just wanted to let people know that this article is available open access. So if you wanted to um, take a look at the reference list, I realize some of the um, references didn't make it onto the slide. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Lippi Kasimal, and I'm from Brigham, Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. I'm co-presenting with David Dorr from Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. And I'd just like to mention the names of the other co-authors, Helen Fu, Jibril Kamara, Jing Wang, and Arlene Bierman. So the purpose of this paper was to take a deep dive into kind of promise, potential, and uh, barriers to health information technology solutions. Uh, we, you know, we've talked a lot about the the some of the challenges that are faced for uh, people with MCC: lack of coordination and communication being two of the really uh, important ones, I think. And so we know that health information technology can bring together what we call data information and knowledge in the informatics world and also facilitate communication. And these two things can really optimize um, overall health potentially, but there's risk, there's added complexity. Uh, fragmentation of care can be kind of amplified if there is not good um, reconciliation of different electronic care plans, for example. And there can be a burden to both the, the persons living with MCC, their caregivers, family members, and uh, other members of the care team. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is from something that Dave Dorr published in Frontiers of Engineering. It's a spaghetti diagram, kind of a composite of, of different patients he's cared for as a primary care physician. And you see there, you know, you have 12 specialists, seven of which are, are active at the time that the snapshot was taken, the patient in the orange diamond, and then a daughter it, represented by an oval, another caregiver represented by another oval, and a primary care team in the circle. And then at the bottom, you see several different conditions listed. Um, and then the, the icons kind of uh, signify different aspects of care that need to be taken into account by all of the, all of the members of the care team and the patient. Next slide, please. So, you know, that was the norm. And I think the other thing to highlight is that the health IT landscape is changing, has recently changed quite a bit. Um, now, we know that those of us that are people that use health IT every day in our clinical jobs uh, or as patients or caregivers, there are a lot of problems with current health IT usability. Uh, there's been a focus on it for 5, 10, 15 years, but still it's not quite where we expect it to be, um, you know, given the state of other types of technology that we use every day workflow, the, the technology is kind of limited in terms of where it can present information. It's not always present to the right person at the right time through the right channel. Fragmentation, of course, I kind of talked about that already, and lack of interoperability. So recent policy changes, and the, the icon in the lower left is sort of calling to your attention um, 21st century cures and policy changes around interoperability and kind of raising the bar for the expectations around interoperability. And then also the fact that the, the systems, the technology itself, you know, have become much more sophisticated and able to do things like you know, either validate or develop or, or evaluate prediction models and hopefully bring these prediction models to the point of care in a way that they can really uh, improve outcomes. Now, some other issues that come up are that the healthcare organizations in general are not really ready for this new era. I mean, things have started to move very quickly. And then finally, I think, as I sort of said just now, we don't really know which of these changes will help people living with multiple chronic conditions, which will impact clinical outcomes, which will impact other types of outcomes that matter to patients and their families and their caregivers. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of referencing a project that uh, Dave Dorr was the PI, Care Management Plus. On the left, you see kind of that same uh, diagram that I showed you. And then on the right is this kind of you know, hub and spoke model with the primary care team and with a care manager situated embedded within the primary care team and the health IT acting as intermediaries for the patient, family, caregiver, the specialists, and sort of bringing together the care plans for multiple chronic conditions. You know, so this, this project was meant to try to explore what are the scalable systems that can really improve outcomes for people with MCC. Um, and, you know, let's look at that from the point of view of the care teams, the health systems, the payers, the policymakers. Um, and, you know, this is a, this is a study that's funded by a couple of groups, but I think going forward, we can really build off of these types of ideas. Next slide, please. So another thing I wanted to pause, and I, I feel like we talked about this a little bit, but we didn't quite call it the digital divide. And I think this is a very important thing to think about is whether or not the people that we're concerned about can use the technology 
uh, from the patient or person perspective that we'd like them to be able to use. So one paper out of Metro Health in Cleveland show, showed that only 29% of the patients use the patient portal. Um, some of the demographic characteristics are listed there. A paper I did with my uh, colleague and mentor, mentee, Jorge Rodriguez, uh, show that even after controlling for sociodemographic factors, internet broadband access is associated with portal use. And so I think we have, as kind of has been called out already, levels of inequity, um, societal inequity, social terms of health, and coming even into the digital divide that all work together to limit the access that patients have to the health IT that may be able to really help them. Uh, and so I think we're making some strides forward and we need to keep moving in that direction in this country. Next slide, please. So I just want to pause again. We talked a little bit about um, the care that happens between clinical encounters earlier. And uh, I, I always reference this AHRQ care coordination um, activities list, which comes from the care coordination measures atlas. Uh, you, you know, that kind of divides out some broad domains of care coordination. And then I, I really like how these activities are very specific, very concrete. Um, you know, people in the care teams need to establish accountability so that people aren't duplicating effort. Uh, the communication needs to be interpersonal as well as information transfer. Someone earlier was talking about the fact that people need to talk to each other rather than just um, use the technology. I 100% agree. Uh, and then also, um, you know, we need to talk about facilitating transitions. And then in terms of helping patients assessing their needs and goals and helping them to be part of creating a proactive plan of care, monitoring follow-up and responding to change, that's the care between. Um, I won't read through the rest of these. I think everyone's pretty familiar. Uh, next slide, please. And so when we, uh, when we started to work on this review, we wanted to think in three major domains, but keep paying attention to some cross-cutting topics. So the major domains are one where we group together care planning and care coordination, kind of referencing those activities. The second was we grouped together patient and family, self-management and patient reported outcomes, um, given the fact that remote patient monitoring and other ways of uh, collecting information directly from patients would kind of fit into that domain. And then the third, we kind of lumped together algorithms, predictive modeling, and artificial intelligence. We think it's very important to keep in mind cross-cutting topics such as equity and complexity. And I'll hand it over to my colleague. Next slide. Thanks. So um, these cross-cutting topics are incredibly important. They've been mentioned before, but here for uh, bias, um, HIT just sort of replicates the bias that we already have um, in our health system and society. And this paper by Obermeyer, if you look on the right, showed that an algorithm that tried to predict who might uh, generate the most healthcare costs um, uh, was equally identifying black and white populations. However, if you look on the left, the black populations had much worse chronic condition outcomes, higher rates of multiple chronic conditions. And so um, we have to be really careful about how we implement these. Secondly, for complexity, Lipica already mentioned this, that um, HIT layered on top of a complex system makes things more complex and can add burden. Next slide, please. So our methods, we did a structured review. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is we got 2,000, just under 2,000 articles. But really, when we look at um, uh, multiple chronic conditions, health information technology, and these three areas where we really see the most promise, they, they really winnow down to 44. So, um, you know, there's many gaps yet in terms of applying these models um, it, through HIT, and, and that's what we want to highlight. Next slide. So one study that was a, a very nice one to call out was asked about in the chat already was this um, 3D study from a primary care in England. And basically this is a multi-component intervention, which is very important. HIT doesn't live alone. You have to think about how it integrates. In this one, um, there was really a care planning effort um, that was uh, facilitated by uh, the physician and nurse on the patient's care team. And although they're, they're over, over Overall outcome in this RCT quality of life wasn't improved. There was much better um, work on patient-centered care, having a care plan, and, and really being part of that. So that's a great step forward. Next slide. Um, for self-management, similarly, um, uh, there's um, a number of studies, and there's actually many reviews about this, but really when you look at multiple chronic conditions and self-management, they're either very general or um, they're specific to one condition. Um, this I-team 
covered multiple conditions, COPD, CHF, mental health, and functional status through ADLs. And they actually showed some significant impacts on um, depression screening and actually a reduction on emergency department visits, really saying, hey, we need to think about these together and, and, and perhaps as we've seen, you know, mental health can can drive a lot of the engagement and, and motivation and may be a priority uh, to, to address. Next slide. And then algorithms. Algorithms are complicated. Um, there are thousands of articles about algorithms, which we've seen finally some summaries that maybe they're not doing everything we can. We just highlight two. There are so many out there. Um, but this um, nice one by Sorosi from Europe um, looks at uh, clinical decision support that tries to combine different knowledge into algorithms that you can um, uh, look at for the multiple chronic conditions here, diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia um, to guide uh, decision-making, shared decision-making. Um, next click. Um, and then Robusto, um, I really like because um, although there are lots of algorithms that stratify patients and where their multiple chronic conditions are important, they actually did a drug complexity index that, that really talks about how the different treatments we give patients really lend themselves to um, um, put, you know, potentially worse outcomes over time and thinking about burden um, of, of treatment rather than just thinking about the conditions alone. Next slide. So um, AHRQ is working on this through the eCare plan. And for time, I won't go into this, but we've implemented this at OHSU. And it's this is a Firebase app that really brings together information and is working with a, a large number of stakeholders, including NIDDK, to understand how we can do this electronically better. Next slide. And then finally, our grand challenge is what we really came out of this is like, you have to think about what your HIT is going to do. Does it summarize information to make it easier to understand through that and simplification? Does it help prioritize what's most important right now, bringing the patient voice? There's errors that need to be adjudicated. How do we do that? And finally, everything should move towards some kind of important decision that's guided by the patient actionability. So we have to think about that. So that's all we have. Thank you so much. We'll pass it to Victor. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Victor Montori, Mayo Clinic, and um, delighted to be part of uh, this group. Um, next slide. I had the distinct pleasure of having to look at over, look at over, uh, over the uh, papers that were submitted for this special issue and uh, try to draw main points and try to um, see what we can learn from that. So this is my summary of those points and uh, refer you back to the paper for their full context. But I think a first point is that disease-oriented industrialized healthcare responds poorly to people with complicated care demands. And so to that extent, patients with multiple chronic conditions are our canary in the coal mine. They accumulate all the toxicities in the system bef before and, and to a greater extent than everyone else. So if you want to know that if healthcare is uh, better improving at uh, caring for people, the place to look is uh, patients with multiple chronic conditions. In part is because, uh, or the evidence of this is that we are not noticing well what is the burden of illness and the burden of treatment that patients are accumulating and we're therefore not responding to them effectively. And we recognize, as Arlene pointed out at the beginning, that social, economic, political, and corporate factors worsen the problems of developing chronic conditions and impede access or access to high quality responses to those problems. So these patients are all stuck in a, a vicious cycle of worsening. Um, the, the response is, of course, primary care for multimorbidity. Primary care, thinking of it as um, not, not necessarily some of the forms of primary care that are evolving now, but rather the kind of old-fashioned primary care where the clinicians were not just not, not proud of being expert in a particular disease, but proud of being experts in the human condition. Um, uh, where the care can be careful, uh, that is uh, evidence-based and responsing, responsive to, this, to the problems of this person, not of persons like this. Um, provisional, and that is constantly being revised as the situation uh, changes. And participatory, um, using uh, shared decision-making approaches. And uh, the care should also be kind in that 
uh, I don't not not referring to to warm and fuzzy, but I'm referring mostly to the ident seeing the, the the patient as a whole person that could be us, um, and being very respectful of the limited time, energy, and attention they have for their lives. So, in other words, the plans of care have to be minimal, the disruptives of people's lives and people's loves. Um, and that this, this care has to be cultivated. It has to have conditions for it to thrive. So there are issues of culture and policies and, and services and tech that will enable this. And we've heard through the discussion of these papers how there are some innovations and some isolated e efforts, but the evidence base of cultivating care that supports um, these kinds of patients remains fairly weak. Um, and there has been a direction in the absence of guidance from the evidence, there's been a direction towards focusing on service lines, focusing on lowering costs, uh, particularly in primary care, and uh, looking for engagement for guideline concordance rather than engagement for whole person care. And I, I've, I'm labeling that as, I think, the wrong direction. Um, and there have been some, uh, given the, that primary care for multimorbidity is apparently failing. There's been some problematic alternatives that are evolving, like carve out services that pick up a particular condition, disease, or physiologic variable, um, and outsource its management to, um, to people with lower skills that are not experts on the human condition, but that respond narrowly to the issue at hand, and that end up delegating substantial amount of care to patients and families to execute on a day-to-day -day basis, overwhelming them. And then there is a deployment of semi-automatic tech that provides surveillance of people's behaviors and seeks to modify those behaviors towards particular targets for people like them, not for specifically for them, therefore violating this um, goal-oriented care that um, uh, was described earlier in this webinar as the, goal, as the North Star. Next slide, please. Additionally, I think in terms of going forward, uh, my uh, commentary uh, uh, put, uh, places two directions. One is the investment in primary care relationships. Uh, oftentimes, healthcare is considered a, a string of services. I think we should be thinking about a, a, a connection of, uh, of a, a string of uh, relationships rather than services. Um, I think if we notice what is necessary, participation, collaboration, care, these are fundamental human activities. So we do need to double down and invest in the, in the human resources available to provide care for this expanding and complicated uh, set of the population. We need to make sure that when we do engagement, we engage to co-create care based on relationships and in the context of unhurried conversations, which I have historically labeled as uh, the, probably the most important innovation we need to accomplish in the healthcare system. And the goal for all this is not to develop efficient services where we can process people faster at a lower cost, but elegant services in which we, we have the ability without waste, but also without haste to care well. And then we need to invest in health services research focused on care. Um, uh, care, the fundamental purpose of healthcare remains largely unobserved in our, day, in, in our work. Um, and even though care translates policy into value at the macro level, but also into sensible care plans that affect the lives of each of these people at the micro level. Next slide. So the, in essence, what happens is we, we, we look at policies and we look at the effect of those policies on outcomes and costs. And if we don't find the outcomes and costs that are desirable or expected of the policies, we go back and modify the policies and see if we get a better result. What we are leaving in the middle, care is essentially a black box, or in the metaphor I use in the paper, it's a piñata that we keep hitting with different kinds of policies, hoping that will come out will be better outcomes and better costs. But really, what's coming out is clinician burnout, overwhelmed patients, corruption of the medical records, bloated with information that's irrelevant, and a cruel dismantling of the patient clinician relationship. So, the hypothesis of all this is that patients with multimorbidity and other complexities need careful and kind care that we need to expand methods that directly observe care, uh, which are, I think, superior to measures of experience or the documented care that stands for the care that actually happened, and that we need to do more observational and experimental dive-ins into that intimate space of patient care. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, Victor. And we have, um... Uh, you know, a number of uh, questions in the chat. We have a few uh, minutes. 
Um, I wish we could get to all of them. Several people asked about funding. ARC welcomes your, your applications in this area and it cross cuts of our work. Um, after seeing your comments, I will try to put together, uh, you know, some information on our relevant funding opportunities and post them on our multiple chronic condition website. Um, somebody also asked um, about upstream causes and that's really, um, of interest to ARC, and we're interested in models of care that link primary care with other sectors in order to improve care, because we don't think it's this is all in the healthcare center, especially the prevention and helping with uh, social needs and addressing the social determinants of health. Actually, there was a question on shared decision making and the role of shared decision making in all of this, and I think I'll ask Victor to respond to that one. Yes, uh, thanks, Arlene. I think Patrick was making the question about what are the priorities for shared decision making in multiple chronic conditions. And I think a, a, a fundamental development that occurred about three years ago was the discovery of purposeful SDM, which is the connection of SDM with the purpose. So, so the kind of problems that we're using shared, de shared decision making to solve. And once we connect that to those problems and to the goals of the patient, it fits very well with multiple chronic condition. But that creates then two additional research agendas. One is, how do we recognize when shared decision making is happening across the four purposes that purposeful SDM identifies? Selecting based on preferences, uh, resolving conflicts, uh, uh, resolving problems, and uh, creating insight and context for a complex, complicated situation. And then, um, given that we're moving away from the notion of developing a tool, a shared decision making tool or a decision aid for each one, which only corresponds to one of those purposes, but not the other three, then the next thing is how do we cultivate the conditions for shared decision making to occur within the healthcare system? And once again, uh, unhurried conversations, not long, just unhurried conversations become really important alongside with tools to support those conversations if needed, in addition to the attitudes and skills to, to have the disposition to uh, bring patients to co-create care, uh, recognizing that we that cannot be the project of just one of the parties, just of the caregiver. It has to be a joint achievement. Yeah, so I, I think we have time just for one more quick question, and I'm going to direct this one to Liz Bayless. Um, Liz, um, somebody asked about the transitional care model, and I think, you know, what you did was in your paper was kind of look at what we've learned from the different models out there, but also identified why none of them fully meet the needs that we have. So maybe you could comment on that. Thanks, Arlene. I, I think what we found primarily in, in talking to people, system leaders and um, and doing the literature search is that these models of care are not, um, <laughs> they're not full models, I think, and they're not being implemented in a way that they can really be examined. Um, and that furthermore, every model that can be served, every model is foundational for, for adding on to them. And I think Victor's um, comments support that as well. There's sort of this idea that what was a model of care at one point can be added to and supported and enhanced with, um, with new knowledge and new evidence. Um, so I don't think it's that one model is not effective or, or should be discarded. It's more that, that they sort of need to be integrated if that helps answer the question at all. Yeah, so somebody just asked, um, David Meltzer, thanks for attending. Um, yes, we're going to post the recording of this on the um, ARC website. I see we're just about out of time, but you can see how much thought went into all of these papers. And, uh, you know, this is not an easy topic to tackle. Um, we know it's not easy, but we think we have to go there. And it's really critical. So we, we really welcome your ideas, your inputs, your applications, and we hope this is the beginning of a conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today.